Okay, thank you all for coming. I'm Summer, I'm the curator here at the museum. Before we get started, everybody please take a second to turn off or silence your phones so we don't have any disruptions. Um, for announcements, we are in the midst of our membership drive. So if you're already a member, just a quick reminder to please renew your membership. And if you're not yet a member, we encourage you to consider becoming one. Getting into lectures like this for free is just one of the perks, and we have information on membership at that back table if you're interested. Um, a note on our upcoming holiday hours, we will be open for half the day on Christmas Eve and then closed all of Christmas Day, and then we'll be closed for half the day on New Year's Eve and closed for all of New Year's Day. As for upcoming programs, our next third on third on the 17th, which is next Friday, is the exhibit opening of 1821, Florida Becomes a U.S. Territory. The exhibit discusses Florida's transfer from Spain to the U.S. Uh, through the adams onis Treaty. For the third on third lecture, Bill Tilson and Mike Harrison will speak about changes in the lives of Fernandina residents as a result of the treaty. And uh, some of the things you'll learn about tonight will be included in the exhibit, so that's kind of a sneak peek for you. <laughs> And then for our brown bag lunch next month on January 5th, we will have the museum's archivist Rhonda Outler speak about getting started in genealogical research. So that's it for announcements, but I'd like to thank our sponsors for tonight's program. This program is a partnership between the Florida Humanities and the Amelia Island Museum of History. Funding for this program was provided by Florida Humanities and sponsored in part by the State of Florida Department of State Division of Arts and Culture, and the Florida Council on Arts and Culture. Peggy Volger, who is on the board of the hum Florida Humanities, is going to say a few words about Florida Humanities. Actually, uh, thank you. Many of you know me as a board member of this museum, which I'm very proud to be board member here, but I'm also a board member of the funder of this program. I recuse myself on the, on the uh, decision making. But I just wanted to uh, tell you that you, you will see there are some evaluation uh, uh, pieces of paper there, cards. We need as many evaluations filled out as we can get because uh, Florida Humanities is expanding its Speakers Bureau and I, I have to say, uh, we have a fabulous Speakers Bureau. You, you're going to be hearing one today. But I really hope that you will fill out those evaluations and be honest because we, we need to know where we can serve better. And uh, one thing I'm so proud about is that our museum here is the only uh, cultural organization that has regularly received Florida Humanities grants over the years because of the work we're doing. Yes. <laughs> so um, it, we have a very small staff and they work all the time. <laughs> so that's all I wanted to say. Just please do <coughs> fill out a uh, evaluation if you can. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so that's it for announcements, but tonight our speaker is Dr. David Head. David Head is a historian, author, and associate lecturer of history at the University of Central Florida. He grew up in Western New York, where he received his BA in history from Niagara University and his PhD from the University at Buffalo. An expert on pirates and privateers, as well as on George Washington and the American Revolution, he is the author, most recently, of A Crisis of Peace, George Washington, The Newburgh Conspiracy, and The Fate of the American Revolution. In addition to his scholarly publications, David's work has appeared in USA Today, The Orlando Centennial, The Washington Examiner, and The Bulwark. So everyone, please welcome David Head. Well, thank you everybody for coming out here tonight, and I want to express my uh, my thanks to Summer for the uh, invitation here to speak at the museum here to you. I was chatting uh, before we began and, and reminiscing about the uh, the fact that uh, when I was a teenager, my family came to Amelia Island for uh, vacation for several years, 
uh, in August. Um, <laughs> not, in, uh, not, 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 not when it was like this, nice, nice like this. Um, we stayed at Amelia Island Plantation, so down on the, the southern part of the island. So it, it's just amazing that I ended up writing part of my first book um, took place on Amelia Island, uh, the place where I had gone as a, as a younger person. So it's, a, it's just kind of an amazing connection there. And now I'm here back with, uh, back with you. I want to talk today about an episode in Amelia Island's history um, in which it became the centerpiece of a contest between Spain and its rebellious colonies in the early 19th century as uh, Spain's colonies in the New World were, were some of them were fighting for their independence. I want to talk a little bit about how that happened, how the United States was involved, and some of the colorful personalities who were involved in that episode of uh, engaging in piracy and some privateering <coughs> from right here in Amelia Island. I'll talk about who this guy here is in a minute. Overview of what I want to cover here today. So I'll talk a little bit about the Spanish-American Wars of Independence, some background on those. I'll talk a little bit about what exactly privateers and pirates were and how to distinguish between the two, what makes one different from the other. And then I'll say a few things about where we are today and what it was called back in the 19th century meaning East Florida. So this was East Florida, as distinct from West Florida. <laughs> They're very creative in the, the naming of the places. I'll talk a little bit about the, there are two, um, uh, really one invasion of Amelia Island and one occupation by a, a, another, another force. One led by that gentleman we saw before with the rosy cheeks there, that is Gregor McGregor, and another by a man named Louis Michel Ory. Finally, I'll talk a little bit about the US intervention in, on Amelia Island. Uh, I'll talk about President James Monroe and his decision to intervene in what was foreign territory, not within the United States. Uh, some support and criticism and his decision to stay or leave. Okay, so those are the topics that I want to talk about here today. Uh, of course, you are familiar with where we are um, here on the, the, the map there, but I want to, to sort of stress kind of the importance of that, that border there. Right? Georgia is right over that border, but in the 19th century, that was the border between the United States and Spain. So an international border was right here. So some background to our story briefly to kind of situate where we are uh, in terms of the Spanish-American Wars of Independence. So uh, the Spanish-American Wars of Independence are touched off by Napoleon and his invasion of Spain. So really, the Spanish-American Wars of Independence are part of the larger Napoleonic Wars that engulfed Europe uh, all, all through Europe and involved many of the very diff various different countries in that larger conflict. So this is one piece of that conflict. Napoleon invaded Spain in 1808. He deposed the Spanish king, sent him into exile, King Ferdinand, kicked him out of the, out of the way. And does anyone, can anyone guess, does anyone know who did uh, Napoleon install as the new king of Spain? It's not his brother. It was his brother, one of his brothers, yes. <laughs> this, this was his strategy to keep rule right, within the family, so he put a brother, he has a bunch of brothers. Okay. I have two brothers, and you know those jerks have never made me king of anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> or they can say the same about me, I haven't yeah. made them king of anywhere. Okay. So Napoleon made his brother king of Spain. And of course, the, the Spanish people, they don't like this, being ruled by an outsider and a, a, a Bonaparte, that's not what they want. So a number of groups called juntas form to govern in the king's name. This is a, a Spanish tradition, that if the king were not actually in power, these groups would form to govern temporarily on behalf of the king, imagining that the king might be restored to power one day. So it's supposed to be temporary. Now, at the same time, there are other people who are thinking, OK, that's one step to get the king out of the way. We can govern in the king's name. But what if we made this permanent and governed in our own name to declare independence from Spain? Okay, so not simply fighting against the French, declaring independence from the French rule, but also independence from Spain itself. So some of those juntas, but not all, some of them in, uh, in Spanish America begin declaring their independence from Spain. So there are multiple sides to the Spanish-American Wars of Independence. Okay, everybody hates the French. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody in the 19th century Spanish-American world, world hates the French. What, what did you think of I mean? uh, uh, the, the, uh, They're all against the French, right? They're all Napoleon. They all agree on that. 
But then there are some groups that are fighting for their independence from Spain, others that would like to main, remain loyal to the King of Spain. And it's not a neat division between Spanish America and Spain itself. There are groups within Spanish America who want to stay loyal to Spain and others who are seeking their independence. So this is both a foreign war and a kind of civil war, both at the same time. Now, those groups that are seeking independence, one of the tools that they use to, to fight for their independence is that they commission privateers. They declare themselves a legitimate government. This is declaring independence in Venezuela, coincidentally also on July 4th, okay. <laughs> you know, 1811, not you know, 1776, but it happens to be the same day. Um, they commission privateers. Now, that simply raises a question, what is a privateer? So a privateer is a privately owned warship. So it's not a naval vessel, which is owned by the government. It's a privately owned vessel. And it's a warship. It is armed and equipped. Right? The whole point is that it's supposed to go out and attack enemies. The critical thing that makes a privateer different from pirates, I'll talk about in a second, uh, is that a privateer has a commission. A commission is a, a, a legal document, a license. Back uh, in earlier times, in the 18th and 17th century, it was called a letter of mark. A, that's kind of a, a, a more, um, I don't know, sort of uh, romantic or elaborate name for it. By the 19th century, it's almost always called a commission. It's not quite as, as, uh, as fun. It's usually called a commission. This is an example of a privateering commission from 1817. And these were these are large documents. They're often um, they're part form letter. Okay? So you have like it's all part of it's printed, and then you just fill in things like the name of the ship, the name of the captain, how many men they have, how many guns it carries, okay? and then it's signed by an authority. Uh, sometimes they're really cool. You get the the big red wax seal on there. So these are kind of fun. They don't tell you a whole lot, but they're kind of fun to see. And again, they're 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 big. They're like like the size of this this lectern here. Sometimes they're they're, they're big things. So those are, those are kind of neat to find. Uh, so that's an example of a privateering commission. The motivation of privateers is that they get to keep what they capture. Yeah. So if they capture an enemy vessel, they get to keep it. Uh, okay, really they, they sell it and they keep the proceeds of that sale, but they really do. Uh, sometimes they, the government will, will place a, a taxes and fees on this. You gotta share your cut, right, with the government and then all that kind of thing. But they get to keep the captured prizes. So a captured vessel is called a prize. Uh, there's supposed to be a court proceeding in which you will go to the court, present evidence, uh, present testimony, including from the sailors who might have been captured, or that establishes that you follow the rules, that this is really an enemy vessel that you're allowed to capture, all that kind of thing. And if the court agrees, then they say this property is transferred to your control. Okay, so it belongs to you. Privateers exist only during times of war, and they're only supposed to attack enemies. Okay, so that's a, a critical thing. They have a license to attack enemies during times of war. A pirate, by contrast, has no legal authority. So a, con a pirate does not have a commission, does not belong to any particular country, and pirates attack anyone at any time. <laughs> so, yeah, okay, <laughs> right, anybody is a potential, anybody is a potential, um, a potential victim. <laughs> Now, there's a lot, oftentimes, confusion. There, there are hard cases, right, that are hard to, to separate out who's who. Uh, for example, the commission might, might not be valid. Right? If the government that issues it is not a real government, then it's not a valid commission. Or the commission, they usually expire after a year. Or it is expired, it's, you can't do the, that kind of thing. Oftentimes, the test that a court will use, at least the US court will use, is to test, to see whether the, the privateer stuck to only the enemies of their country when they captured. If they just captured the ones they're supposed to capture, like who their enemy is, then the court is unlikely to, to say that they're pirates, even if they exceeded the commission in some way. If they attack everybody from multiple different countries, including neutrals, then they're more likely to be seen as a pirate. So that's kind of the critical test that's often employed in courts. Okay, we're almost there. I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, East Florida. So Florida in the early 19th century, there are two Floridas, East Florida and West Florida. And the border between the two is the Apalachicola River. Do you know what else is, a, is a, today? There's a, what else 
is bordered at the Apalachicola River. Apalachicola River. What's that? No. Have you driven I-10 from Jacksonville to Tallahassee? Oh, yes. It's the central time zone. Right. The east, that, that's still the, the border between the, the, the central time zone and the eastern time zone. Yes. yes. Okay, so next time you're driving that boarding stretch of road, yes. you can entertain whoever you're with for 30 seconds. <laughs> and say, you know, this used to be the border between east and west Florida. <laughs> oh, fascinating. Um, East Florida's capital was at St. Augustine, and Pensacola was the capital of West Florida. The British, incidentally, had done that. When the British gained control following the Seven Years' War in 1763 that ended, they divided Florida into two, two, um, two colonies. And then when the Spanish got Florida back following the American Revolution, they kept that, that organization of East and West Florida. Um, we, the Floridas, both of them are loyal to Spain throughout the revolutions. Okay, so these are, they do not declare independence on their own. They stay loyal to Spain. They have a, a sparse um, population of um, people of uh, European ancestry. Okay. So there's a native population, slave population, um, and a European population. It, it's, it's generally not that many people total in, um, in the Floridas, especially small in the people of European background. But still, it's strategically important because of the way Florida st sticks out into the um, in, into the, uh, the ocean there. Uh, East Florida in particular, so why Spain hangs on to East Florida. Um, the way that you would travel back to Spain, so ships would go to the Caribbean, uh, the way the wind and the currents work, you have to kind of go from Spain, imagine Spain's up here, you go down an arc through the Caribbean, up this way, and you'd end up at Havana, right, regroup, mm -hmm. Havana, and then you'd have to go up this way, see the arrows, to go up this way through the, through the channel here and then curve back to Spain that way. Huh. Now, put your pirate hats on. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, English hats, and anybody who's an enemy of Spain. What are you going to do if you want to capture ships headed home to Spain? You're going to sit right here. Yeah. Okay, you're not going to go down here by Havana, because they'll sit after you. Just sit right there, because ships, they can't go this way, because the Bahamas are there, and it's just narrow. And you can't go this way, because Florida's there. So you just sit right there and wait, and then you have good chances. So there's a, a um, force here, up here in St. Augustine, that can kind of help the Spanish clear out this area here to protect the ships coming home. So it, it's for the kind of, just the, the strategy involved in geography is what makes East Florida important. Okay. Let's talk about General uh, Gregor McGregor. <laughs> This fellow here. I love his name because you can tell immediately that he is, of course, from. No, he's from Italy. No, he's from... No, of course he's a. Of course he's Scottish. Um, Gregor McGregor. He claimed to be noble, Sir Gregor McGregor, and he insisted on being called Sir Gregor McGregor at all times. The source of this nobility was somewhat obscure. To put it nicely. Sometimes he claimed to be the the heir to a noble family. In Scotland. Other times he claims he had been knighted by the uh, King of Portugal for his military <laughs> service to the Portuguese. I suppose it really depended on who he was talking to and whether they knew more about Scotland or Portugal, uh, <laughs> what his story was going to be. Uh, he was a British officer, so he was in the, the British Army, and he was part of the Peninsular Campaign, uh, fighting, the, um, the Sp uh, fighting the French, Napoleon's uh, forces in uh, Spain and Portugal. Uh, that's where he claimed to have been knighted by the, Port the, the Portuguese king for his service during the, during the Peninsular War. Huh. Okay. Uh, he had trouble getting along with others. Uh, <laughs> apparently he had some fight with fellow officers, that's the story. Uh, I think the card game was involved. Perhaps uh, there were screams of, you cheated somewhere in there. Um, and McGregor, right, he, he resigns his commission. And then he goes looking for new opportunities. Actually, uh, the problem is that his, his first wife uh, passes away, and she had all the money. And he loses, uh, he loses his uh, connection to her family, so he's got to go find something else to do. Uh, then he ends up in South America. Now, the Spanish-American governments that were seeking their independence, they were looking for European-trained officers, right? men with right, actual military experience you know, in the European army. They would have be much better, much stronger than any uh, homegrown officers that they had. So they were looking for European officers. And 
Sir Gregor was like, well, here I am. <laughs> uh, I had a, a commission in the British Army, and that was, you know, that. So he shows up in Venezuela. Um, he eventually marries a uh, cousin of Simon Bolivar. Uh, so you see a painting of Josepha McGregor there. Um, you know, so of course that connection helps to him to be able to, to rise to politics that help. He's involved in several uh, several battles and campaigns um, as part of the larger war of Venezuela's war seeking independence. And then he has trouble getting along with others again. Um, he wants to have an independent command. Doesn't like necessarily taking orders from anybody else. So he comes up with the idea of this freelance expedition is that he's going to go off on his own, raise his own army, and undertake his own campaign. So this is the plan that he comes up with. The plan that he comes up with. So he travels to the United States, uh, and he recruits men in, along the eastern seaboard in uh, Philadelphia, New York, eventually Charleston and Savannah also. And so he gathers men and supplies in the United States. This is illegal. <laughs> it is illegal to form an expedition to attack a country at peace with the United States. Yeah. <laughs> Can't do that. So that's illegal. One of the things he does when he's in Philadelphia is that he meets with several Spanish-American agents. Uh, Philadelphia was a hub of Spanish-American uh, activity. Hmm. And he meets with some of these agents, and he says, this is my plan. I would like your blessing to make this all nice and official and, and, and legal and everything. And they give him a document, a commission, right, empowering him to attack uh, Florida. This is also illegal. <laughs> uh, I have the document. I, I, I need to find it. I have the document where the actual thing, the actual thing is it says, you know, uh, signed, sealed, and delivered at, uh, in, in Philadelphia on such and such a date. Okay? That is a signed admission of a felony <laughs> to accept a, a foreign commission in the United States to attack a government at peace with the United States. Right? Uh, he actually shows this off to the U.S. diplomats. Say, look, it's legal. Like, no, you, you just broke the law. <laughs> um, it doesn't make things legal. The plan then, so once he gets his man and supplies, gets his commission, is going to conquer Amelia Island. <laughs> and um, this is the site of where the Spanish fort was. Uh, you, you probably know where this is here today. Uh, I, I visited there several years ago, and the fort's gone. It's just an empty field. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was a little disappointing. Uh, his plan then, once he chases the Spanish out of their fort, is to establish a base of operations to sponsor privateering. Right, with his official commission, he can form an official government and sponsor privateering. Engage in smuggling across the border into Georgia, where there's a more lucrative market into Georgia. Uh, and incidentally, sm uh, smuggling both goods and uh, enslaved people is part of the plan. And then he's going to be resupplied. He's arranged for a ship to come from New York to resupply with more men and more, more, more food and more uh, uh, guns and stuff like that. And then he's going to push on to conquer the rest of Florida. <laughs> so that's the goal. And then by uh, then the Spanish will be forced to defend that. They'll draw resources away from their other areas. Okay, so that's the plan. Okay, step one. He gathered his men of supplies. We saw that. Step two, he got his commission. Step three, he had success conquering Amelia Island. So he attacks on June 29th, 1817. Can you believe that four years ago when that, that date passed that I forgot about it completely? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully I'll be around for the, for the 250th one. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, yeah, it's just, it slipped my mind. It was like into August. Oh yeah, that was an important date that I've been looking forward to. Uh, his hundred men scare away the Spanish defenders. There were not actually that many people defending. It was like a dozen men in that fort. <laughs> McGregor then proclaimed the uh, a new country, the uh, the Republic of the Floridas. <laughs> I'll spare you my, my Spanish pronunciation. <laughs> the Republic of the Floridas. He dabbles in flag design, <laughs> designing his own flag there, and he also dabbled in uh, striking a medal. It's a commemorative medal for this great feat of arms. Huh. Which we have on display, by the way. You have it on display, really? Oh, I'd like to see that. Those, those, those are rare. Those are rare. Those are, those are pretty rare. Um, well, I guess there's only there's, there's only 100 guys who participated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look at the slogan here. I'll also spare you my Latin. Uh, does anyone know where this slogan, 
Where does that come from? Peter. Okay, my. Okay, my. Okay, my. Okay, my. Okay, my. Okay, my. Who said that? Julius Caesar, right? And there's a book on the the uh, the on, on, on Gaul, right? So you can see, right? Julius Caesar, Sir Gregor McGregor, right? equal commanders in the annals of military greatness. Um, yes, Floridarium Duque McGregor. I, I told you he was Italian. The, the, the <laughs> now it turns out that this didn't go, that was where the plan ended. Um, he had little privateering, could not attract from any ships to come here, and he, I think, issued maybe about five or six different commissions. They did some raiding along the plantations along the coast here, but not anything big. Um, There's not much smuggling that went on, never got that going underway. Uh, the ship uh, that was supposed to come from New York. It was detained by the customs collector of New York City. It was the guy who was on his game. Um, he saw the ship that, you know, the, the captain said he's just going to go on a merchant trading voyage. And the customs collector sees, you know, he has, you know, like hundreds of guns on there. And, you know, like a hundred men. On a merchant voyage, you might need like ten. Like, you can imagine the thing. Why do you have so many men and so many guns? What's the captain supposed to say? I get lonely, and we like to shoot <laughs> <laughs> I love to see that. Go <laughs> this is, hey, it's my bachelor party. We're going. <laughs> so he's detained, and they, they take off the man and the guns, and say, okay, if you're really just going to go trade, you can, you can have whatever's appropriate to a trading voyage. Well, there's not enough men or supplies. So McGregor, I mean, yeah, he gives up. Uh, he also hears, learns that there's a counterattack coming from St. Augustine. The Spanish have regrouped, and they're going to send a larger force to take back Amelia Island. Okay, so McGregor wants to get out of here. This is not going to work. He abandons Florida. Uh, he gets on um, his flagship that is the, called the Lady, the Lady McGregor. <laughs> that was nice of him to name the ship after uh, Josepha there. And he sails away, abandoning Florida. The next thing he does, the next time he shows up, he is pursuing a real estate fraud in Central America. <laughs> right? What do you think he sell 500% of the, the land available in the colony there? You could have stayed in, that in Florida. Yeah, right. I was say, you could have stayed in Florida to do that. <laughs> so lots, lots of small yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think you're supposed to call it a conservation view. That's right. what you call it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's McGregor has left. So there's that's not the last chapter of the Amelia Island story. Um, some of McGregor, some not all the men go with him, so he leaves a kind of remnant behind, the guys who want to keep trying uh, after McGregor has left. And actually, that remnant is successful at defeating the Spanish counterattack. <laughs> the Spanish they come and attack; they're not able to retake Amelia Island; they're driven off. The leaders of that remnant. And you're trying to organize things, and then two days later, a new guy shows up. This is where uh, Louis um, or, um, Louis Michel Ori shows up. And he just like you know drops anchor in the in the harbor there. I'm like, hey guys, what's going on? <laughs> uh, Commodore uh, Ori, he was a had been so he's originally from France. You thought I was going to say Italy, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> he's originally from France, and he came over to Pierce. He came over as part of the French Navy. And then uh, probably deserted the, the French Navy in the Caribbean. He became a privateer captain, um, and then he also joined the Cartagena Navy. Cartagena is a city in um, Colombia today, and it was kind of its own city state at the time. It had declared independence from Spain and from the larger uh, <laughs> Colombian government at the same time, so kind of on their own. Uh, so he's been part of the Cartagena Navy. That's where he gets the title of Commodore. Right? Commodore is someone who's temporarily in charge of uh, several ships. Okay? Um, then, oh, he also has trouble playing well with others. Uh, <laughs> Cartagena was uh, defeated by the Spanish at the end of 1815, and then the, 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 um, the, the rebels there, they escaped, and they go to Haiti. They regroup in Haiti. Simon Bolivar has this plan about what, what he's going to do, and uh, Ori says, no, I'm not going with you, Simon Bolivar, he wants to go out on his own. He joins a Mexican filibuster uh, expedition. <laughs> a filibuster is a private military expedition. 
right? So not in a military, an arm, not an army sponsored by a government, but by like a bunch of guys get together and have their own invasion. I don't know how it gets mixed up with the Senate yeah. maneuver. I honestly don't know. Yeah, that's I think this. I think this meaning comes first, right? This is like. Well, yeah. It's, it's come from the French or the Dutch for freebooter. I think. I don't know how that gets. Exactly. I don't know how that gets in the Senate maneuver, but a uh, filibuster. So this Mexican fil. So there's a group of guys who are going to invade Mexico, and they're they're led by these uh, rebels who want to secure independence. He ends up as governor of Galveston, Texas, an island off the coast of Texas. And he has the blessing of the local uh, Spanish, um, not, not Spanish, the, the local Mexican leader. Right? It says establishes you as the, as the governor of Galveston. He operates uh, there for a little while until he is pushed out of power by Jean and Pierre Lafitte. I saw there's a Lafitte Road or Avenue oh, close yeah. by? Yeah. yeah. The, the Lafitte's were never here in Amelia Island. They were not here in Amelia Island. Uh, but they were on Galveston and they, they pushed Ori out of power. Okay. And then they take over Galveston. Ori has been pushed out of power, takes his ships, goes sailing for something else. He's heard about McGregor and Amelia Island, and that's how he, why he shows up here. A couple of, a little bit late to see McGregor, but the same opportunity is there. He takes charge of Amelia. And, but under the authority of the Mexican government. <laughs> so he's using the authority of the Mexican government to um, call himself chief of the Mexican Republic. The Here. Mexican Republic of Amelia Island. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is supposedly a self-portrait. I've never been able to verify if that's really him and if it is him if he really did it himself. Yeah. But that's the only image that I have of yeah. uh, of Ori, so yeah. so I use it. Yeah. Yeah. There's an Ori Island on the plantation. Oh, okay, an Ori Island, yes. Yeah, named, yeah. named after him. So there he is. Okay. Commodore Ori enjoys much more success where McGregor had failed. So uh, this is a um, this is a commission. Okay, this one I have in color. Uh, again, you can see the nice red wax seal there. And he says, the Republic of Mexico. And he's, you notice here he is, right, he has the Spanish version of his name. Well, at least of Luis there. Yeah. And Luis. Yeah. All right. And the form letter, right, in the, whatever, the year of our independence down there at the bottom. Okay, so it's really, really neat there. Uh, I found this in the, the National Archives today. It has these case files that relate to these incidents. And that's where I found that one. You can see how you would fold it up. It's probably in real life. It's probably as big as this image. It's probably how big it really was. Now you kind of fold it up as part of the just papers, right, and, and bring it out. It carefully unfold it so I don't break it. Um, that's there. So uh, um, Ori was much more successful at attracting privateers who would come to Amelia Island to unload their goods and, and to sell the goods, unload the goods and sell them. Uh, one newspaper estimated that in the fall of 1817, Ori had processed some $500,000 worth of prize goods. Wow. Now, um, convert that to today, um, That's you can multiply by about 10, it's easy to do, about what they'll be worth in today's money. It's about $5 million in prize goods. I'll just give you a rough, a rough idea of what, and what it might be. Okay. Well, it might be more than that now, since our record, <laughs> our record inflation in the last few years. So. But it gives this is a very rough idea of what, what it is. Um, Ori was also a, a high-level uh, slave trader. So he um, moved in, um, some 600 to 950 people. Again, again in only a few months, uh, came through Amelia Island um, on the ships that, um, that he welcomed to Amelia Island. And those people were um, uh, taken from Amelia Island uh, along sort of the back country and the um, the, uh, the St. Mary's River there. And then he goes you know, for several miles in the back country and cross over into Georgia and then up and be sold into the, the Georgia plantations. Mm -hmm. um, that's, I guess that, that's my estimate there. So I spent, I remember spending an afternoon counting the number of people who have been brought through one way or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a depressing afternoon. I don't, <laughs> uh, yeah, don't want to do that anymore. Because they're just, I mean, it's, 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 what's, it was depressing, you know, obviously, but in another level, 
they're just the people are just listed like other other stuff on board the ship. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's not like a special concern or category or something, and they're not even all that precise, right? I have a, a 600, 950. And I think I really want to know exactly how many they are. Like, well, it's uh, no, no, two dozen maybe, or 50 to 75, or just like they're mm -hmm. estimating, you know, something very quickly. Right? You can tell the people that this does, it just doesn't register for them in the way we think it should. Um, Ori also tries to form an official government, and he was in the process of drafting a constitution. He modeled on some borrowing some elements from the United States Constitution, um, the Federalist Papers. Right? He has a couple of guys working on that, so trying to draft a Republican style of government. One of the things that made Ori so successful is that he was very sharp in exploiting some loopholes in the United States law. So one of these has to do with the way, just again, the geography here, that you could put some goods and, and people uh, aboard a rowboat and row on the river into Georgia. You could do that. The law at the time, the customs law, right, established that um, smuggling, smuggling laws and other laws applied to vessels of 10 tons or more. <laughs> right? a, a ton, 10 tons is a measure of volume, yeah. okay, not, not weight, but volume. Um, so the, the idea being that you know if you have limited manpower, right, you're not gonna you, know, you, you want to go after the big ship, bigger ships, right, that have a lot of goods on them. Something small is not gonna bring in a whole lot, so don't worry about it. Well, if you do that enough times, enough small boats, right, kind of roll this one after another, um, that can be have a big impact. Sometimes it's said that um, you know is that sometimes the enslaved people would do the rowing; they row themselves over <laughs> over there, forced to row themselves over, right. Mm -hmm. Um, one quote I found is that one uh, U.S. Navy official was complaining that uh, they, the privateers, the pirates, can smuggle one or two at a time without detection. Mm. So this is going on in small boats. Another loophole in uh, U.S. law has to do with U.S. neutrality law. So the United States was officially neutral in the Spanish-American Wars of Independence. Uh, the United States position was those are wars between Spain and its colonies, and we will treat both sides equally. Now, in practice, it tends to be that by treating both sides equally, they tend to, practically speaking, help the Spanish-American governments more than the government of Spain. Right? The Spanish-American governments that are smaller and, more and less experienced, they want access to U.S. ports. Spain doesn't want access to U.S. ports. They don't need it. Right? They can send stuff from Spain. They, you know, they don't need to have access to U.S. ports in the same way. Um, so the United States considers Amelia Island like this neutral territory. It's outside the United States. The United States is at peace with both Spain and Spanish America. They're not going to intervene. And so the Spanish government will come and say, you know, all these goods and these enslaved people are ending up in Georgia. Why don't you go stop them? The Spanish minister will say that to the U.S. Um, Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams. And Adams says, well, that's, that's foreign territory. We can't, I can't just, what do you want me to do? Go, right, add that to the United States? That's, that's not what you want, right? Um, <laughs> Adams would have said, sure, just give us the territory, uh, and we'll do, we, we'll police it, just give it over to us. Okay. <laughs> Another, again, a, um, a naval commander is writing back, basically saying, that I'm following your orders. Right? He said, I can see these ships right, going into Amelia Island, but I consider it neutral ground, and it was the wish of the government not to infringe. So I can see this happening, but you guys have told me not to do anything. So uh, don't complain when you get yelled at by the Spanish minister. <laughs> Well, U.S. US um, intervention here. As I've hinted at, the problem is that Amelia Island is outside of the United States. This is foreign territory. Any way you slice it, it's foreign territory. Either it belongs to Spain or it belongs to a Spanish-American government. And it is leading to violations of U.S. law, violations of U.S. revenue law, the smuggling, violations of U.S. neutrality law by arming and equipping these uh, expeditions in the United States. Violation of the uh, slave trade laws. It's illegal to introduce uh, enslaved people from abroad at, the, at this point. Okay. And there are acts of piracy happening as well. So uh, some of these ships that claim to be privateers are attacking neutral vessels that aren't at war with, uh, with Spain. And this is all involving Americans and some of the crew and all that kind of thing. Okay, so the United States has to do something. But if they act, they might offend Spain. Again, if they act too aggressively, and take over Amelia Island, that might offend Spain. And the United States is uh, negotiating that transcontinental treaty, the, the uh, Adams-O'Neill Treaty. 
Okay. I usually say transcontinental because I, I think find that easier to, to pronounce than the name of the Spanish ambassador. So, <laughs> I, I made a note how you pronounced it. It's very good. <laughs> so you're, you're braver than I am. I just call it a transcontinental treaty. <laughs> anyway, um, so they don't want to upset that because that's a much bigger deal. That's acquiring Florida, that's settling a border with Texas and out to uh, the Pacific Ocean. That's a big deal for the United States. Don't want to mess that up. Uh, at the same time, they're afraid that if they intervene, they might offend the Spanish-Americans. The cause of Spanish-American independence is very popular within the United States. So it is politically popular. Um, it's always just kind of a fad. They're, on holidays, people will drink toasts. Right? Um, can anybody guess how many toasts do they usually drink? Good patriotic Americans, how many toasts of whiskey do they drink? Three. The as many as possible. Oh. Usually at least 13. Oh. At least 13. All right, at least 13. And then you'll have like additions onto that, right? You have 13 official toasts, and then they go after that. And then they are toasts. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and usually included in this period, they usually include, like, they'll start with, you know, to the United States and to the Constitution and to liberty. And, all. and eventually they get to, you know, to Simone Bolivar and to, you know, our, our, our sister republics to the South and all that kind of thing. It was a popular thing to do. Again, another fad was to name uh, to name little boys, to name them Bolivar or Simone Bolivar. Sometimes it's funny because you can tell the way they print the, the uh, pronunciation is like Bolivar, something like that. Right? Yeah. Definitely not the Spanish pronunciation. So it's a thing the United States is popular. So that's going to hurt domestically if it's too aggressive. Eventually, under the, um, under the guidance of Secretary of State John Quincy Adams, President Monroe and his other his cabinet, they decide to go ahead with military action and intervention. There are four things that convince them. Number one, the ongoing violations of US law that I mentioned already. Number two is that Amelia Island was actually the fourth place where this was happening in the previous decade. So I mentioned Galveston previously. There was also in Louisiana, the Lafitte's were active there in New Orleans and starting about 1810, 1811 in there. And then in Baltimore, uh, after the War of 1812, there's Spanish-American privateering from Baltimore. So this is the fourth one. And it looks like this problem is getting worse. And maybe if this one had come first chronologically, it would have been less urgent. But it's the fourth one. Okay, they let these other ones go. It's got to stop it somewhere. Adams convinces Monroe that there's no reason to respect the legitimacy of the Spanish-American governments that have claimed to set up in Amelia Island. So no Republic of the Floridas under McGregor, this, the, you know, so that's not a real thing. And then no, you know, how, how in the world does the, the commission from the governor of Mexico get to claim Florida as part of Mexico? <laughs> yeah, this is not, they're not, not, not contiguous, right? it's just, it doesn't make sense. Okay, so they don't have to respect those, those governments. Finally, just very handily, there is a secret law that just happens to address this situation <laughs> called the No Transfer Resolution of 1811. Congress had enacted this law in 1811 that authorized the president to use force um, to, per to seize Florida if it looked like Florida was going to fall into the hands of a country other than Spain. What the United States is afraid will happen is that British will, get, will grab, uh, that Britain will grab Florida and then therefore Spain won't have it to, to give to the United States through the treaty. They want Spain to keep Florida so then, then the United States can get it from Spain. If the British get it, they're not going to ever give it to the United States. Okay. So the law is that if it looks like Britain or really anybody might grab Spain, um, might grab Florida, then the United States should go and get it first. Okay. And this is a secret law. They don't make it public because if they made it public, then right, Britain's going to act first, right, before, uh, well, I give this, this law that says you can grab it, we're going to go home and get it first. So they made it secret. Then they made it public at, for this occasion. It's not what they envisioned, but, you know, it fits. One time an audience asked me if we still have secret laws today. And I said, well, of course not. Then a second later, well, how do I know? <laughs> how, would I, how would I know? I don't know. So maybe, I don't know. Uh, the, United, the United States Army and Navy shows up on Amelia Island, and um, Ori is, he leaves. There's no battle, there's no confrontation. He sees the overwhelming numbers, and he leaves. So he's out with a whimper. Um, Ori, is only, I believe he's only like 28 at the time. He's in, his, he's in his 20s when he's doing all this. 
Um, he continues to try to have another expedition on behalf of the Spanish American independence, um, but he dies when he falls off a horse. <laughs> and again, I think before he was 30. And so a short, a, a short life, a uh, short but eventful life that he lived. The United States decides not to give, back, give, uh, give Amelia Allen back. There's a debate about this, the pros and cons. But the United States decides that they're going to hold on to this territory rather than give it to Spain and risk Spain losing it again. Okay? They're going to hold on to this and you know, sort of keep it pending negotiations over the Transcontinental Treaty. And eventually when that treaty is signed, the debate over Amelia Island becomes rolled into that. And so Amelia Island joined the United States first before the rest of Florida did. Okay, so a, uh, a point of pride that you can yeah. take from We need to a little bit capitalize on that. Yes. That brings me to the end of my, my presentation. Okay. And I want to thank you for, again, for coming out tonight. Um, I had a, a delightful time talking to you about uh, some, of, some of my research. I have my information there. I'm happy to, to answer questions here. But if you should be drifting off to sleep tonight and think, ah, I wanted to ask you about Gregor McGregor. Okay. Do not spend the rest of the night tossing and turning. Okay. You can contact me here one of these ways, and I'll be happy to, um, to continue our conversation uh, after tonight. Yeah, thank you. Yes, we have one person here. I'm curious. Um, Lily Aubrey, um, he came to a media island with um, $500,000 worth of uh, or gold. No, so, so, other, so ships arrived. Uh, these are privateering vessels, some of them commissioned by the various Spanish American countries. Uh, they, they came to Amelia Island with the, the vessels and the goods that they had captured. And they, would, they would sell them here and get the money, and then Ori would like process those, those goods and, and arrange for their transportation into Georgia. Okay. So no, he doesn't have the $500,000 when he arrives. It's an estimated $500,000 worth of goods moved through Amelia Island during that period. And one other quick question. Yes. Um, I never knew that um, Greg and McGray had, had another wife, an earlier wife, than Josepha. Who was that? Yes, I believe I believe that she was, I don't know, I can't remember her name. I believe she's a British uh, British woman. Um, I don't know her story, except that I believe that it was her death that kind of put him in some financial uh, financial problems <coughs> that he solved by coming to Spanish America. I believe that's the, that's the story. Okay. Yes? How many days or weeks, months did each of those two people have in control of Amelia Island? Mm -hmm. And where did Ari get his money to, for his initial takeover of Amelia? So how long, we're talking, so McGregor's um, invasion is June 29th, and he's only there for about six weeks or so. <laughs> um, and I believe it's early September when, um, when Ori shows up. So the, and then the United States chases him out at the end of December, early January. So this is less than six months yeah. where this is all, oh, wow. all happened. And Ori is in charge longer than McGregor. And then there's, 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 there's that, that um, interregnum period there of two days. Right? Where did he get his funds for his... Where did he get his funds for? So I think he... I, so he had been operating out of uh, Galveston, mm -hmm. doing the same thing, right? He was the, kind of sponsoring the privateering, you know, setting things up so that people could come there, sell their goods, and then you know, trans other people would transport them back into the United States. Um, so that's where the, his revenue must have come from, this kind of thing. Yeah. Yes. I'm wondering about privateers and why they would uh, stick with the government when the government taxed them. Uh, why would they go off on their? What was the incentive, I guess, for Yes. Yeah, so, so you get legal title to the goods. Okay. So you get legal title to the goods so that you can sell them to somebody else, and the original owner can't come back and say, "Look, that stuff is mine. It's stolen." <laughs> All right. If, if they have, if you bought those goods, right? Then you say, no, look, I have a court order. Okay? The, 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 the legal title is transferred I mean, forcibly from you to somebody else, and I bought them. You can't have them back. So that's the incentive to follow the rules, is that when you sell it, the buyer of those goods will pay more because they have confidence that they legally own that. The original owners cannot get it back. And I don't, I don't know. I can't really think of another example where you have that kind of forcible transfer of title to something. Right? <laughs> 
I don't know, maybe is something is seized, but I don't know, seized by the government and sold or something at an auction. Secret law. Yeah, secret law. Okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, that is the advantage. You had the legal title. Yes. When Ori was in Galveston, that was actually part of Mexico at that point, correct? Because Texas didn't come in until the late 1830s. Right, so it, it's called the, the, within, okay, so, so the, it, the place is called Texas. Well, whatever the Spanish pronunciation of the day house, right? Um, right. That, so it's, a, it's, a, it's part of right, it's a province within uh, the Spanish Mexico, and then Mexico gains its independence 1821. So then Texas is a state within Mexico, um, and then you're right. Then it becomes an independent country in 1836 or whatever, right? Following the the Alamo and the the, the um, right the right the, the Texas Revolution. Okay. So yeah, so Galveston was part of. Well, it, at this point, it's still up for grabs, right? 1817 is still up for grabs. Is this part of Spain or is it right? Is it part of Mexico? The government, the the rebel government, independent seeking government claims. That they're a legitimate government, but they're still fighting uh, over this, and it depends on the year and the time who who had the upper hand. Yeah. So so yes, yeah, so you're, you're, you're you've basically got the story right. Yes. Yeah. I'm interested in the um, smuggling of, of slaves mm -hmm. through Fernandina into Georgia, mm -hmm. which seems to me would be, um, you know, the Georgians would get a get a bargain mm -hmm. because. <coughs> They're, they're being imported. Right. But at the same time, um, weren't they uh, um, pressuring the U.S. government to to take Florida or to um, start a revolution in Florida because they really didn't like the free blacks in Florida? Right. So Florida, right, so Florida under the Spanish is often a place where um, runaway slaves will go. Yeah. Uh, they have a better chance at freedom in, in the Spanish system than they would in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one of the right that's one of the issues. I guess that's one of those things, like, you know, they might be thinking about what their long term interest would be would be to cut off right add that to the United States and cut off a place for enslaved people to run to. But then they might be thinking about their immediate need is for another person, right? Mm -hmm. To work, whatever. So you can see the same person might advocate both, might want to by somebody, right, who comes in, at the same time they argue, no, we should cut this cut this off because we want this all to be part of the United States, so that this person that, I, that they just bought won't have a place to run away to. So I guess I guess that, that could make could make sense that they could balance both of those kind of your immediate interests and the long longer term interest. Yeah. One thing I want to add um, about even in cases where the United States is able to find out these people are being smuggled, those enslaved people they, they don't get their freedom. Mm -hmm. They are then auctioned with the proceeds going to the United States. Wow. Okay. So they, they don't they're, they're not they don't get their freedom. They're not sent back to where they came from. Um, they end up right living in, and working enslaved in the United States. Um, it's just you know who gets the proceeds of the money, and then if somebody's caught doing this, they might be punished. But if you're the person, right, it, your fate is the same either way. When the breakers comes, about how many European citizens are in Amelia Island at that time? Oh, I have the number in my book, and I can't remember okay. what it is. I, I honestly, I don't remember. Um, yeah. No, I can picture myself looking it up. <laughs> I know. I can tell you the book I got it from him roughly when I did it, but I cannot remember what the number is. You'll wake up tonight. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but who am I going to ask? <laughs> I have to wait till I can get to the library and find out. What's the name of your book? Uh, my first book, uh, what this research came from, is called Privateers of the Americas. So, Privateers of the Americas: Spanish American Privateering from the United States during the Early Republic. And that's all listed on. If you go to my website, there it's listed. Okay. It's listed there. Yes. Um, we learned in some of our training here that Louis Aru was illiterate. Do you know if that's true? And if it, it's not unreasonable. To right. Think um, that. Did he have some brains? No, I, him? I have copies of his letters. You do. Yeah. So he was not. Uh, uh, they're in French. Which I which I can't read, um, <laughs> but I have right, I, uh, I have um, I have um, 
I have a, there's a small collection at um, the Library of Congress. And I took pictures of it, um, but I was never able to do anything with it because I can't, I can't read the French. Actually, what I, this is a funny story. So, so, um, so, when, so when, I, when, I, when I met my wife, she mentioned, she's from, some, from South America originally, so she knows Spanish, and she mentioned she studied French for a while. I'm like, hey, okay, so translate stuff for me. <laughs> well, of course, it's in the it's in the 19th century handwriting too, which you can't. Right? Yeah. That, that's the, that's probably yeah. the bigger. Option. Yeah, that's the bigger. Yeah, you know, something. So, so no, I never got those translated. That's a kind of research project out there. If I ever find a grad student who can <laughs> do this, I can do you give this to him. Letters too, do you know? Uh, some of the the ones I, I can touch. Some of them are to his parents. Oh, okay. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. To his parents. He has an account book in there too. Um, it's not big. I mean, it's not that much stuff. But I, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have, anybody wants to take a crack at it, email me, I'll send you the file. So <laughs> you can do it, you can get a public you can get a publication for your, your tenure file. So Actually we might have a board member who could do that. Yeah, I will yeah. you know, I'd, I'd be happy to send it to anybody who wants yeah. to wants to do it. Yeah. I've been sitting on it for fifteen years now. So. Yeah, you know, as a folklorist, I'm just wondering you know, as a folk course, I'm just fascinated that uh, Fernandina has got glommed on to this pirate thing like crazy mm -hmm. and they only ruled for less than six months mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering you did work all over it are there other cities that do the same thing that said oh, there was a pirate here right well New Orleans does this a lot with the Lafitte's mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of Lafitte yeah. stuff in New Orleans and you know there's what some, about Tampa Tampa, the Tampa Buccaneers. yeah the Buccaneers right the, the Gasparilla mm -hmm. and then I mean, Gasparilla is, is legendary and that's not a real is that a real person? I know. Um, yeah. At least the at least the Lafitte's are real people. Yeah. Even yeah. if there's lots so of stuff. So is Louis or right, or, right. So those but, are real people, and stuff is you know you know, sort of fact and fiction. Um, right. Some of those places. I mean, I I guess the interesting thing. Where does that start? Does that go back to the 19th century, the early 20th century? Uh, I can imagine it's probably bundled up with uh, tourism and you know increasing tourism. Right, Tampa as a but tourist it's the destination. the anti-hero. So. I mean, you know, it's like, oh. Right, but that, that's, a, that's a theme that's there. The anti-hero theme is there in literature on pirates going back to the, the 18th century at least. Mm -hmm. um, that's part of the attraction of reading about pirates is that they do these awful things and they get punished for it, but they do these things, right? They have adventures in the Caribbean and all that kind of stuff. Um, another a book I edited. Um, so other people wrote the essays, and I just kind of brought them together and edited them. Uh, several of the essays address where that mythology comes from. Uh, that, that book is called The Golden Age of Piracy. Mm -hmm. and, and again, some of, them, some of those essays trace the, the popular culture of piracy. And again, it's right there from the time, you know, there's Blackbeard and Captain Kidd and all those guys. The allure of pirates as anti-heroes is there right, right from the beginning. We embrace it. Here. Yeah, we embrace it. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Could you give me a quick overview of that Adam Zonis treaty and who, who was involved in that and what all it settled? So it settles, most importantly, it settles the border between the United States and Spain. So the United States acquires Florida, and then uh, Spain gets a favorable border on Texas, right? So the United States gives up some territory where they're disputing with the Texas border. Uh, they get to Florida, and then the border is settled in such a way that the United States gains access to some part of Oregon territory and, and access to the Pacific Ocean. So it primarily settles the border between the two. Now, the United States, um, this is sometimes a, um, the United States actually does, does not buy Florida. What they do is they assume Spain's responsibility for paying damages to U.S. citizens. <laughs> Okay, because of things like Spain had promised to let the United States uh, citizens use uh, New Orleans, mm -hmm. and then they, they did it for a time. And then the United States merchants wanted damages for that. And then during the Napoleonic Wars, um, some French privateers captured neutral American vessels and took them to Spanish ports to, to sell the goods. Right? And the, the United States blamed Spain for violating U.S. neutrality and wanted damages. Mm -hmm. So the United States, I think it's $15 million is the number, I think. Mm -hmm. So the United States government pays $15 million to its own people okay, so that the Spanish don't have to. Would that make sense? Okay. And in exchange, the United States receives Florida. Okay. So I guess some U.S. taxpayers paid other people. Yeah. They got um, 
they got Florida. Okay, so that's rough. That's very briefly what the um, transcontinental treaty. I have a short, brief essay about that too. Just by if you Google my my name and transcontinental treaty, it should come up. Okay. It's something I did um, a couple. Uh, it was right before the pandemic, so a couple years ago now. Yeah. Thank you. I know that that's how we figure time now, right? <laughs> Relationship to pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. Well, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. And we, we hope to see you all next week at the exhibit opening. You can learn more about the treat. <laughs> Thank you.